He exemplifies the power of believing in yourself and all the good that can come of it. You know who we're talking about, Mustafa Abdul Amid, formerly of the UCLA basketball team, went to two Final Fours. He's an all-around great guy. Mustafa, thanks for doing this. Given the fact that you know, you've got dad life going on right now, I don't want to take too much of your time. Yeah, I got in trouble. I was supposed to put my son down, and I had to duck out my wife, but she's awesome. So uh, dad life has been a lot of fun in this lockdown time, man. We just get outside and run around, so it's busy, but a lot of time to spend with, spend with my son, so it's been a lot of fun. So you've got a son who is right around, what, two years old, yeah. and Michael Roll of the UCLA basketball team just had a son, and you know, the, the, the debate that goes on with me right now, Mustafa, is who's going to have the son that's the better shooter? <laughs> well, we'll see. I tell you, my kid, his name is Kai. He's not a half-court player, man. He's full court in transition. He's going all out. So this quarantine time has been tough on him. You know what I mean? He's not, you know, what you call sets for him, coach. So <laughs> we'll see. Maybe young Brando Rowe will be the better shooter, but we'll see who gets out and gets easy buckets in transition. Yeah, I mean, like we were talking about before we started, I think Michael, he's either changing diapers or teaching his son a jump shot, and I'm not yeah. sure in which order. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's well, my... I, I'll tell you, I, I, won't, uh, I won't be the dad who says my, my kids can be better, but I'll call Mike out all day. And tell him I'll, 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 I'll outshoot Mike, so we'll – has he already been has he already talked to he's, he's been on this but oh, yeah, so i can he, say whatever i want now yeah <laughs> but he came on he came on mustafa before he had the kid so okay. james keith was like there's a little bit of a a rivalry going on between you know mustafa and michael about the kid their, their sons and who's going to be the better player one day well we'll see what happens i'll tell you one thing i uh it, it changes once you get this age i got a kid brother who's 16 now and he's starting to go through this recruiting stuff so I beat him the last time in one-on-one, and I'm done. So it'll probably be the same with these kids. I won't be playing very much. You'd rather go 1-0 and than, as he gets older, 1-38. and Or yeah, you, know, you can always hold it above his head. I'll give you a quick story. I remember sure. the last time I played one-on-one -on -one with my dad. We were in Maryland for a family reunion. And my dad, he played in college at Wichita State, New Mexico State. And uh, so we're playing one-on-one. -on -one. We're on blacktop. It's hot, shirts off, everything. And we're playing, and I'm about to win. So he gets a stop. He gets the ball back. He goes by me. You know that kind of old trick where you grab a leg when you go by? He okay. grabs a leg, ends up, throws me on my butt. I'm on my back. He finishes the layup and tosses the ball at me, and he gets the win. That was the last time I played with my dad. So I think it'll be about the same with me. <laughs> well, we're going to hold you to that because yeah. it sounds like you've got a lot of talent in your family, multi-generational talent here. And Mustafa so you've got the talent off the court too. And, you know, you've been such an academic scholar and how do you turn down Harvard for the opportunity to walk on at UCLA? Yeah, it's funny because there wasn't much of a choice for me. My, my mom and I were reminiscing and we were, we were talking about Aster, you know, as I'm a father and going through things with my family, you know, what were different periods of life like as, as being a mom? And she was saying to, to me that, yeah, things were always great. That was a decision that was very hard for her to understand and something she thinks about or thought about quite often and realized that uh, I would make my own decisions. It wasn't a decision that I thought about very much. It was very clear and very obvious what I wanted. If you still ask me, you know, I was a, I'd, I'd be the, the, best, the best point guard on an NBA team. So I'm a little delusional, right? <laughs> but that's what it was. I wanted an opportunity to, to, to play at the highest level. Um, and it was tough. You know, I, I sat a lot. I played, you know, I was on the bench a lot. But all of that, uh, for, the, for the moments that I was able to experience, it was completely worth it. Um, and, yeah, it, it, was, it was the right choice. It was it's yeah, always the right choice, right? Well, obviously, if you go to UCLA, I yeah. mean, there is never a doubt. Mustafa Abdul Ami joining us here on the podcast. And of, of course, Mustafa, you've been asked about this a thousand and one times. So I'll be the thousand and second time to ask you about the buzzer beater against Washington, how that all unfolded and how your teammate and Michael Roll, who we've mentioned already on this podcast, was part of that big play involving you. Yeah, that was a lot of that was a lot of fun. Um, those are the types of moments for me. Uh, I, I think I've always played the game, and I've always had a sense of mastery. 
Uh, whereas you, you hit a limit when it comes to external validation, um, what fans are going to say or, or what the stat sheets say and all of that. And for me, it was to, to try to find a principle. And that principle was to be completely in a, in a flow state and to be completely immersed in a moment. Uh, and that's what that was. And I think that was one of the more enjoyable moments for me playing uh, in, in college. Mike made a great pass and, and give Mike a hard time about what we were just talking about. But look, that guy, and something I'm most proud of and he should be most proud of is if you look at your career after UCLA, he continued to improve. Sure. He's added new things to his game. He can put the ball on the floor. He sees, he's poised. And look at the, the guys playing in Milan right now. Yeah. And, I, and, and I'm bullish on on, on European basketball, international basketball, but you swap out the bottom 150, 200 players in the league for the top guys in Europe, you know, easy. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and so I, I think Mike should be very proud of that. And that moment where you're talking about, he made a great pass. Uh, you forget about the, what happened before uh, is, you know, Vinoy Overton, who we never, like we couldn't stand, we didn't care about USC. We did not like the University of Washington. Interesting. They, they talked more trash, but they were, they were, man. They were good, though. That court, when you would play at uh, Alaska Airlines, man, it would shrink. And they were rough. They were tough. They shrink the court. They were pressing. And uh, Vinoy beat me. I sat, sat on the bench for, you know, 30 out of 35 out of 40 minutes or something. And he was flying. He went down. He made a bucket. And that moment in the, sort of the transition from, defense to offense from something negative to something positive that's where the magic happens right that's where mastery happens sure and so for me that's what I, I'm very proud of of the ability to take that and be in the moment and be able to react very quickly that game winning shot obviously the number one play on sports center that night and you would oh, say, was it that's cool yeah 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 it was <laughs> and though so, wow breaking news here a couple Years later, and you, you're finding this out. Yeah, it was number one <laughs> on Sports Center's top ten. And you said afterwards that you know, quote, I was totally shaking. You know, I was just so <laughs> excited and happy. My leg was shaking the whole time. End quote. And then you had what Ben Hallen said about you, and he has you know the utmost respect for you because he said, quote, no one after seeing what you did in that game against Washington, he said, no one has worked harder, been more committed to the program and the team. How does that resonate with you? Yeah, it's great. I mean, I, I think the thing that I uh, miss most about, about playing is the first thing I miss is team meals. It's because <laughs> one, I've always been a hungry guy, right? But uh, that camaraderie is something that if, I don't know, who listens to the pod, but if there are any, if there are any student athletes right now, like that is, that is what matters is, is those relationships. That is what is remembered. Um, and I know the wins and losses, the championships, all that kind of stuff, but man, it's those relationships. And so for me to hear that, I do appreciate it um, because I sacrificed, um, I think it was a, it was a normal, part of things on that team and the culture and environment we created. Let me say two things. One is sure. it's funny that you bring up that UW moment because we played against Concordia earlier that year, which was a game we were supposed to, you know, beat the brakes off Concordia. Um, and I played a bunch of minutes. James was talking about it the other day. Some, some guy on, uh, I don't really mess with um, any social media stuff. That's a whole yeah. other tension, right? But Somebody had posted a picture, and Spencer Sue, who was a teammate, was a walk on, and one of my great friends, Would he you, sent me a photo. Do you mind if I tell you this really quickly? Yeah. Spencer, I met. I used to work in Memphis, uh -huh. and, yeah. and that's when I met him because oh, he worked really? for the Grizzlies. Oh yeah, I went down yeah, there all the time. Me, Spence, and, and, and Quincy were all all good friends. Really? Uh, yeah. Wow. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, yeah, oh, that was fine. Quincy was uh, almost in tears after that after that UW uh, buzzer beater. By the way, <laughs> I don't know if you could see that. That's something I on Dexter. Really, oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. So when we were playing against Concordia, uh, Spencer sent me this photo and somebody it was like me turning the ball over. I think I turned the ball over like six or seven times that game. Cause I played a whole bunch of minutes and the guy was like, you know, it, it was some comment or something about how I turned it over, how you was a yeah. dog on defense. 
And I remember that. And I, then I sent him a photo back that I found on my computer is when I had hit a shot at the end of that game and we and we'd won that game. And the thing, the story that I was kind of pull out and I talked about is we were down, call it down one, mm-hmm. I don't know, 15 seconds left. I'm tired. Like I, I'm seeing through like a whole this, I can't see anything. Yes. I played 35, 37 minutes. We had a bunch of guys injured. It was all bad. I had turned the ball over a bunch. And so walk onto the court. There's a dude courtside at this preseason game. And he's looking at me and he goes like, y'all are trash, man. <laughs> Just like, I mean, and I'm like, like, yo, you can't go anywhere right now. Right. I may have told this story before. I don't know if you heard it, but like, you can't go anywhere. There's nothing you can do. The game is going to continue on. Yeah. And this guy's looking at you like, you guys are bad. Like, this is embarrassing. So what do you do? You, you get the ball and you play. And we hit a game with a shot. Come say hi. You hit a game. Brian, come here, man. Oh, my say God. Hi? This is Brian. Come here and say hi to Brian. Oh, this is my little guy. What is going on? The future, hi, the future college basketball superstar. <laughs> Yeah, maybe so. All mm-hmm. right, man. We'll you are see you adorable. Later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's Brian. Can you go to mama? Oh, All right. Oh, <laughs> you can, oh man. Yeah, he's a, he's, a, he's a cool little guy. Man. He can come hang out with us anytime. <laughs> <laughs> he needs to go to bed before it all breaks down. Sure. Um, but, yeah, and hit a game with a shot. And that, to me, was a, was a lesson to me, is that there's no Southwest Airlines. Remember that slogan they used to have? It was like, want to get away. Oh yeah, and, uh, yeah. You hit the button and it all disappears. Like, no, you're you're right there and you have this moment and here you go. Um, so that that to me is was probably uh, the bigger moment in terms of uh, a personal development um, on the court and off the court uh, was to experience that and to have some success there and that feels good. When you went from a walk on and then you got the scholarship. What was that feeling like for you? Because in a sense, symbolically, you had to bet on yourself because I would have thought that with every single one of those stars that you were playing with from Russell Westbrook and and Darren Collison, and all these guys that you're going in there and on that team with them, that a scholarship would be hard to come by. So for you to finally get one and to know the risk that you took to get onto that team just to make the team and then to get a scholarship. How did that all sit with you? That must've been, I mean, so fulfilling. In a way, but I didn't care much. I think what was, I I tell you about this, I was probably a pain in the butt. And I look back at it. I was always a kid that was like front row in class, raising his hand, answering questions. And I look back, there's a friend up here in Seattle where I live now. We went to, to, uh, middle school together and he was like dude you were so annoying but you could tell you know so it was the same way on the court like when I I was a walk on that that first year and you know it was a recruited walk on or whatever sure I could tell you a little bit more about that but I I would stand on the opposite side like if you're facing yeah if you're in poly so you're in one corner of the court which were most of the the walk-ons are guys that weren't in practice at that time or standing and the managers I would stand on the opposite, like diagonal, and I had a ball in my hand. And I, again, it's kind of a like, I look back and I'm like, oh, but I was like, that, that ain't me. Like, I, I'm, I'm here. I'm supposed to be on the court. I'm supposed to be playing. Like, hey, coach, you need to look at this differently. I'm talking. I'm chirping. I got a ball in my hand sure. the entire time. And that's not to say anything about the guys that were uh, the other guys that were walking on, but it was like I created a something in my head to say, hey, I want to always differentiate myself. At the same time, like those guys, there's a dude, DeAndre Robinson, um, who walked on. He was a good player in, I don't know where DeAndre's from, somewhere in Orange County, Irvine, something like that. And, you know, those guys were really positive all the time to give you support. And because there are times as a walk on that you're not getting the opportunity that you were. You're playing a whole lot of defense. Um, and those guys were really supportive. And I learned from them. And I, I think I just, I said, hey, I'm going to do whatever I can to trigger something in my mind to be constantly locked in. And for me, it was on the other side of the court with the ball, standing next to coach. <laughs> Probably the coach was like, you know, get away from me, man. But that was, that was what I did. But these are the kind of tools and tricks that you had 
to do to put yourself out there, right? Mm -hmm. Because you were not just okay with being on this team and you wanted that shot and you started to trickle your way into the lineup and, and get some playing time. And to think, Mustafa, that what I've read is you had a very fascinating recruiting journey to UCLA and that you were involved in a camp and, and that you really did not know much about UCLA you know, prior. And, and so what was that all like? Because you then all of a sudden understand the splendor and, and the lore of this program. But for a while, when you were growing up, you had no idea, or I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what, what, what the program was all about. I knew, I knew, I knew the history. My dad, my dad educated me very much so on the history of things. But when I got to camp, I thought Doug Erickson, shout out to Doug, because he was the man. But did I you thought see that Doug great Erickson article that the down. LA Times did I on did. him? Yeah, I did. It's well deserved, man. Like that guy keeps has kept the trains running on time for whatever twenty something years, and has outlasted everybody. Yeah, um, and he takes. It's crazy because there's three people that remember everybody's name. It's John Wooden, a guy named uh, they called him Coach Konchowski. He, he used okay. to work for a, a five star back in the way okay. back in the day, and that guy remembered everybody's name for thousands of players and made you feel when they were somebody remembers your name like that is important and Doug's the same way man he invites everybody back walk on manager treats everybody with respect and that's why like the whole family stays together so I give him a lot of credit so I go to this camp they recruit my buddy Alex Tyus who ended up going to Florida of all places uh who's still who's still playing he's played in Maccabi and played in uh I don't know if he played Milan or played another big club in Italy uh, done great, made a lot of money. And um, so they're recruiting him. I go down there. I don't know anything about these guys. And I play well in uh, again against Darren, against Jordan, and all these other players. Coach just, again, it was probably me like jumping up, raising my hand or something. And the coach is like, hey, you might want to step up and go through this drill. And I'm on the court already. And you, you're playing very free. And that's ultimately what it's about. Um, and I played well and got recruited. So I, I was more of a, was really more of a mid-major kid. So the stuff, the attention I got was, you know, smaller schools in Missouri and Illinois. And the one that I wanted to go to was Davidson. And so they had a guy, Coach Kuzmowski, I think his name was, recruited me pretty heavily. And he told me, he's like, hey, Coach McKillop's going to, we're getting to the point where it's going to make an in-home visit. We're going to make an offer. And then Steph Curry goes back on his verbal commit from Virginia Tech, says he wants to go to Davidson, and I was out. So I, you know, the thing I say all the time is like, Steph, Russ, and I was going to go to Harvard, Jeremy Lin, Jeremy Lin, all owe me a paycheck. I want, I just want commission on those paychecks, you know what I mean? Of course. <laughs> oh, well overdue. Yeah, yeah. So that was kind of how I wound up at, at UCLA, and once I had the opportunity, it was a no-brainer for me. And it was a grind, but I – I loved it, and it gave me the opportunity to play overseas uh, for for a good bit. So, is it safe to say that without you going to this camp, that you would have never been at UCLA? Oh, absolutely! I would not have been at I would not have been at UCLA. I don't know where I would have been. Somewhere, yeah, somewhere. Wow. <laughs> you then go overseas, and I was listening to a prior podcast and kind of discussing some of the the trials that you go through, a lot of culture shock, they do things a lot differently, especially like in Serbia and other places, Slovenia, where you played. And so I wanted to ask you here is like, what is something that you experienced during your time overseas that even to this day is still shocking that you went mm -hmm. through? Yeah, so I would say, I'll say a, a few things. The one, and they're probably not as dramatic as, as we make for a great story, but one of them's kind of funny. <laughs> so uh, it was a guy I played with, Jerome Jordan, who was kind of like a, a, a draft and stash in, in Europe for, for a little bit. He, he was drafted by the Knicks. He played at Tulsa, um, seven-footer, man. Could run, had great hands, could shoot the ball. And, but Jerome is from Jamaica, right? And, and he's seven-foot, seven-foot-one or something like that. And it's me, Jerome, and, and his uh, guy, his buddy who came over there with him, Booker. And so Book is now, uh, he's in the G League coaching or doing some op stuff. And we went over there and had to learn how to drive because I didn't drive a stick at that time. 
And so the dude who taught me the triangles is a guy named Milos, old Serbian guy, he called, used to call me Big Boss. He's a, he's a, he's a great dude. And, but when I'm learning to drive, it's me, Rome, and Book in the car after, you know, they let me out on my home. And we're in a town of 25, 20, 25,000 called Vršić, which is near Belgrade. Like a, they told me it was a half hour away, it was an hour and a half away from the city. I'm like in this little village. I'm driving down the street and then I mess up the clutch, I flip it, and, dum, 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 like, and then all the people in the square turn and look. And they're looking at us, I can't get the car back on. It's three black dudes and there's no other, no other people of color here. It's all service. And everybody just starts to point and laugh. They're like, look at these grown Americans who can't drive the car. So that, that, that made you feel and realize like, hey man, I I'm really am somewhere, somewhere different. But it brought a levity to the whole situation. Uh, and you're part of the community at that point. And so... I think the most transformative experiences for me in playing internationally was that you would go and travel. So we played, um, everywhere I played, also played Europe, right? Which is playing international leagues. So it's, you know, we played EuroLeague qualifiers, we played Euro Cup, Euro Challenge, all this stuff, uh, Adriatic League. And we would go and I would always, I would leave, I would just walk. And so I'd go and I'd explore all these places. I'd talk to people. I learned my Serbian got pretty decent when I was there. I learned German when I was there. And you go and you just kind of, you just walk and get immersed in the city. You know, you have training and then you just leave. And that to me was probably the most beneficial experience was to learn a language, was to spend time, to listen, to talk to people and be with uh, real people. Um, I thought that was cool. And that's something that I've taken with me. And there's no better education than, than seeing it with your own eyes mm -hmm. and being surrounded by that area. And you've been well-traveled, well-rounded, obviously. And you also said that you spent some time in Lebanon and there have obviously been conflict there as well. So what, what stood out from being in that area and dealing with what those, you know, clashing groups and such? Yeah, what's interesting, like when you're in Sarajevo, there's still, at least for me, right? So I, I don't want to blanket it in terms of, I, I haven't spent years there. But when you're driving through parts of Bosnia and, and Sarajevo and then you want to Republic Srpska and these places, like there's a heaviness there. At least I felt when we were driving at nighttime. Um, so I've, I've spent time in Israel and also spent time in, in Lebanon. I lived in Lebanon and Beirut. And you go to Tel, Tel Aviv and Beirut, it's like, same thing. They food's the same. Language is slightly different, but to the untrained ears, it sounds the same. <laughs> um, so, and I know that sort of the depth of a lot of that pain and tragedy is there and experienced by different people. Um, for me, it was always very cool to go and sit and listen. In uh, Beirut, I lived right outside Beirut. So, you know, Lebanon is a very diverse country. Um, I was actually in a Christian part of, of yeah, uh, right outside, it's called Junia, right outside of Beirut. Um, you have a big, you know, Jesus statue, right? And I thought it was an incredible place. The incredible thing about it, there's some documentaries on this stuff uh, on, online about Lebanese basketball. But every team is kind of associated, and I'll be careful how I talk about this now, but it's kind of associated with a political party. And so kind of associated, it has some sort of ethnic dimension. And so a lot of these games at times in the past have turned into political rallies. And, and so you can just imagine like things get really, really heated. Um, so my, you know, my group was, uh, my team was a smaller team there, but we go to all these different places and you could, you could feel the, you could feel the passion. Um, Lebanon was a cool experience for me because I tell you, I always play, like I like to, I, w I wanted to win. And I played on winning teams in, in all these other places, you know, Bundesliga Final Four, Slovenia, we won a national championship. Um, in Serbia, we were a very, very good team. But in Lebanon, it was not a good team. And the team didn't have the same budget. And so they look at you, it's like, no, you need to score 30 a night. <laughs> so I uh that wasn't something that I, I had done since high school yeah. uh so there, there's a game I wake up in the morning and I meet my cereal and I look on Sportando which is like a Euro 
European rumor, like it's just like the news okay. for sport. And it was for time. I was like, oh, they're making changes. Oh, wait, I don't, do I not have a job today? Like what happened, right? I called my coach. I was like, coach, what, what's the deal? They're, they're bringing in new imports. He said, what? I didn't know this. Let me call the president. He calls the president. So coach calls me back. He says, this is ridiculous. I'm so upset about this. Um, uh, I, I don't know what's going on, whatever. You know, I want you to stay and play the next game. Now, will you play the next game? I said, coach, that's not, no, thank you. Like, I've got an opportunity in Germany. My money's going to be on time. I love Germany. Basketball is great. But he says, stay and play. He says, if you don't stay and play, you know, I'm going to lose a job. If I lose a job, I could end up back in, he was actually in Syria. He said, I could go back to Syria. And like, I don't want this. Like, it was very serious. He saw like, wow, this really, you're talking about life and death in a sense here. And I won't get into his personal story, but it's a crazy personal story if we know what's going on or has been going on for the last eight years in Syria. So he said, stay and play. I was kind of like, all right, coach, out of respect for you, I'll stay and play. I played well. I had basically, I had that like 30 and 10 that game. And, uh, and that's a moment that I really remember because it was a moment that I also find that flow not only in how you're playing, the amount of pressure on it, because you're thinking about the pressure. Like the guy before me, before the game told me that a good performance in this game is the difference between life and death. <laughs> it's like, like okay. Um, so that's a moment that stands out to me. But that is what you can deal with in, uh, in places in the Middle East. And I'll add to that, that you know, that sounds very dramatic. In the end, those guys on that team um, or just honest, wonderful, good people. And they showed me the, the city. They took me to restaurants. They really invited me in. So I think I'm caveating what I'm saying because those are dramatic things to say about there and about Serbia. Serbia was the same thing. You know, all these guys, uh, Safke, Pavke, all these guys were just terrific uh, mentors in making sure that if you're honest with them, like you can – you can become a part of that family and experience a culture and life in a whole different way than just going over there. So I do want to make sure that I credit all of these places and people with just being terrific, terrific people. Former UCLA basketball player Mustafa Abdul Amid giving us some riveting stories. And you might be, if not the only, I can't think of many that have done what you did. You, you studied overseas while you were at UCLA. And yeah. you spent some time in Morocco. I mean, you're on UCLA's basketball team and you're studying abroad. How unique is that situation? And then getting to Morocco, what about that experience was eye-opening to you? Oh, Morocco was awesome. So it was my junior year, junior year abroad. Um, athletes, for the most part, particularly basketball, are not going to get to do that, right? You're, you're going to stay and play. I don't know what, what it's like now, but we used to play in a couple of summer leagues and they had say no and a couple other things at that time. And so we would stay and train and play, but I wanted that experience. So I also wanted to learn Arabic. I want to study international policy is um, something that has always been a long-term goal and interest of mine. And so to experience uh, that was why I wanted to go. And it was great. And I lived in a small town in, in Mechmes, which is kind of, I guess you could describe it as the Midwest of, of Morocco. Um, so not on the coast, not a tourist attraction or location or anything like that. But it was it was great. So I went to a university there, um, spent time with people from all over the U.S., which we have to remember how much diversity there there is. I lived with a guy from uh, from Texas and a guy from Nebraska, oh, wow. and like very different places, different people, and you just you just you just lived there. And it was only a few months. Um, but we spent the night a couple nights in Sahara Desert camping out, um, went all over the, went all over the country and I played, I'll tell you the thing I remember is I, I it's, it's how the sport, right? It's an international language. Usually it's football or, you know, soccer, but basketball can be the same. So I went there and there's this old, I was looking for a basket, couldn't find one in the entire city. So I found in this old church that I kind of snuck into, it felt like it, it was, uh, 
So they had like a little courtyard. Everything's outdoors, of course, dusty and dirty. And I go and I start shooting and playing. And then this dude comes up. Uh, he comes out and he's over looking like he lives up there. He's like looking down, you know. I'm like, oh shoot, man! Like I'm in somebody's like neighborhood, you know. I'm like, you know, this might not be good. I might have to find an escape route. Like I don't know, this dude's looking not nice. He comes down, he goes, yeah, one on one. So I was like, what? All right, cool. So we check it up. And like, come on, man! I beat the brakes off of. Uh, I beat him up pretty good. He was. That was a true friendship through those few months. He spoke a bit of English, a pretty good English, I would say. And then he spoke, uh, they speak Dadaja, which is a, I guess you'd call it a dialect. I don't know what you would call it of Arabic, but it's it's distinct um, in Morocco. And we would just hang out. So I do everything in school, walk around, we travel, and then I come back and I hang out and just hoop with this guy. And he was, man, I, I wish I could stay in touch with him, man. I don't know where he is now, but he was a great guy. And then, uh, then a couple of kids would start to come and hang out. This little kid, Saeed, would come and hang out. So it, we got to have a little community, and we hang out in the hoop. And it was a lot of fun. When I was probably 10 years old, my dad worked, when he was alive, he worked in the airlines. And so mm-hmm. he would take us around the world. And we went to Morocco, and we stayed in Marrakesh. And I remember going through a marketplace. I think they called it like the souk or something. Souk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And there's an image Mustafa that I will never forget and that was there was a gentleman there who set up like a little temporary stand and he was a teeth puller he literally had like hundreds of teeth lined up in this little on top of this little cupboard and he had this like makeshift lever like that he would literally literally yank the teeth out I don't know if there was any hygiene or any sanitation or or sanitary uh aspects to this but that is an image mustafa that i'll never forget and i'm sure you saw all kinds of different things like that that set set it apart from what we're used to in the united states yeah no i think when you have a sensory experience like that whether it's visual or it's a you know a factor whatever it is like you, you smell something you hear something you experience something right it's it's carved into your into your mind into your brain so I, I didn't see the teeth puller. I bet if your teeth hurt bad enough, if you got a toothache that's that bad, you could go see that guy. I, I was about to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the, the souks are beautiful, you know, just man, the smells, the sounds. And also something that I always found value in is it's uh, that sense of unknown and uncertainty and sometimes fear, I think is really healthy. Um, my wife and I like the, we like the backpack. Um, so we'll, we'll go out and we'll backpack and it's the same thing where you're in nature, like no matter how like, tough you are, how, how well adjusted you are to, you know, the back country for me, I'm not quite there. And there's always, you're always a little nervous, you're a little uncertain, you're, you're hyper vigilant. And I think that is really valuable. It, you have to break away from, uh, you know, it's like when you're driving down the, the street and you're driving the same way all the time, you become uh, sort of, you, you gloss over a little bit. And I think having experiences where you can't do that, where you have to really be present in that moment is good. And I think for me, that was a, or is one of the, the primary benefits of travel is to be really uncomfortable, um, to, to be outside of your comfort zone and to do it in a way that it's not that it's non-trivial. Like you have to stay there a little bit and you got to sit in that a little bit until uh, your, your mind is really, really open and experiencing things. I feel like I'm reading a chapter out of Eckhart Tolle's book. <laughs> 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 hey, maybe I am. Mustafa Abdul Amit, I love this. And you're obviously very philosophical, you know, well-educated and a deep thinker what spawned this in you? Like, why are you looking at the world this way and and having such a a broad and obviously with all the travels that you've had, such a a multi, you know, cultured experience in in, in having all that? Why is that all so important to you? Yeah, uh, this this may be a little risky because I'm going to try to explain something that I don't know if it's particularly articulate uh, or if I'm going to be able to articulate it. But 
Um, so one that comes, I think, from my, my mom and my dad, um, to be curious, to be open. Um, but for me, what, what I have realized, and of course, not the first to realize it, but to me, it's all the same thing, right? Like the thing that you're doing is, if you're doing it right, it's the same. So if you're playing basketball, and what you're really talking about, if you're playing the game at, the, at a certain level, the, the game within the game, um, it really becomes quite meta and it just keeps spiraling down until you get to the principle. And the principle is all the same. It is about sort of neutrality and, and flow and uh, uh, really being, just finding like true balance. And that happens at the mental level, it happens at the emotional level, it happens, happens at the physical level, right? Your body has to be poised to move in any direction, to shift, to react, and to feel. Same thing, your, your mind is what's gonna empower that. And so it has to be neutral. It cannot be committed to something because once it commits and locks on to that, well now the opponent can always defeat you. Now you don't see anything else because you've locked into one thing. So like basketball is the same, as whether it's entrepreneurship, when you're starting a business, whether it's, it's the same as being um, a good, you know, father or son or brother. For me, I do a whole lot of, I do a lot of martial arts. It's all the same thing. And so if you go from one to the, to the other, people say, well, like, how do you stop playing basketball? I, I was, my trajectory was still going up objectively. Um, I kind of know where I would have landed in terms of salary and in terms of where I would have played. And it was still going up. The experience teaches a lot and I was finally playing a lot. But in terms of mastery and in terms of the principle, I had found or achieved what I needed to from playing the game, but I had a lot to learn from getting into a new place where I was uncomfortable and there was uncertainty and there was more space for innovation and creation. Um, if you want to master it, you have to master the principle, not just the application, right? The application is shooting the ball, passing the ball. The principle is to be completely poised and not rattled by external forces. And so that's kind of the journey that, that I feel like that I'm on. And that certainly comes from my mother and from my, from my father. Uh, and how I think they approach the world, even if they're articulated differently. How would you articulate what you're doing now outside of the game and what you're doing with Boost and other entities and, and pouring in your energy in that way? Yeah, so uh, the most fun, so I started a company while I was still, while I was still playing um, and we've learned and changed and, you know, in Silicon Valley speak, we've pivoted on and on and on. Uh, what we're doing now is it's, it's sports analytics. So we're looking at two-dimensional video. We use computer vision, deep learning to extract data from that video. And then we take that data and then we tell, um, we, we create narratives and stories and visualizations like to take that data and make it useful for a player and team evaluation, right? Uh, to me, that is just a layer of seeing a sport, a game, and understanding it at a deeper level and then taking all of that and communicating it in a very simple way. Uh, you can, you, you talk about algorithms, for instance. We've done a lot of work with um, uh, policing, police bias, community policing, all this stuff and data. You can take these like crazy black box deep learning algorithms and you'll have thousands of factors and you build these complicated models. And in the end, who can understand it? Nobody can use it. The heuristic, the simplification of that thing to deliver to someone that they can now take it and use it, that's where like the mastery comes. So for me, like what we're doing with analytics is taking a game, which is supremely complicated. Um, with what people's brains and bodies are doing is absolutely incredible. And then you throw in the tactics and strategies. Taking that, like, taking all of this and like really mapping it and understanding it and then taking it and simplifying it and giving it to a coach, to a player and being able to communicate it in a very simple way. So we take data, capture unique data and machine learning algorithms that produce insights. We take those and we automatically generate them into text so that you can understand like 
hey, uh, these, these are Brian's tendencies. This is how he thinks about things. These are the trends in the lead, on and on and on. So for me, like I said, the thing is the same. The principle is the same. The application is slightly different, but it's all the same. And is that, is that the, coup, the company Boost you're working with? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, so it's been a lot of fun. It's also been fun to build a team. We're about 12 to 15 people right now, um, engineers. We have a PhD in, in astrophysics, a PhD in signals processing. We have some awesome engineers. My co-founder is a multi-time founder. She's exited from a company. And now you're putting that together. You're solving a really hard problem with limited resources. And you got to figure out how to make that team work. You've got to manage those people. You've got to create processes around it. It's just like a team. And I found that to be really challenging and really enjoyable. Uh, Building a culture, it's been a lot of fun. So it's been, it's been, for this, it's been a cool experience. Uh, That's what we've been doing. Spend most of my time on LinkedIn. Mustafa Abdul Ahmed, just dazzling on the court, off the court. He's going full court press. (laughs) <laughs> with his life, even though he's not playing anymore, it's it's fascinating, and he's got the the mental firepower to do anything. And you can see how that belief in himself and his thirst for learning has led him to just this wonderful journey that has brought so much learning and has given him so much to tell others about and to teach. You really are a teacher. I I because. I, 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 I just I think that you have so many different stories to tell, and what that does is it enriches everybody around you. And I don't have like a an actual meter, but I think my IQ during this interview went up like ten points. <laughs> That's funny. You know, I uh, my wife and I, my wife is far more impressive than I am. Um, but we co-taught uh, at the University of Washington. Um, they're not teaching this quarter. Things are kind of kind of funny, but we taught last quarter and uh, together uh, in their high school, informatics school. It's kind of like design. Um, And teaching is really, really hard. And so that's something I can tell you at UCLA, which was really cool. There are a couple of professors and teachers that teaching just is so undervalued and something that I realized uh, I got a whole lot to learn uh, to take these complex things and simplify them and, and and reach people. But that's something I'm really, really grateful for. I remember I had a couple of professors there, uh, in particular one who was my global studies mentor for my thesis. And these folks, are, they're, they're amazing. And so I think we really need to kind of kind of give an applause for them uh, as well. It's something that I think gets forgotten. You're also a father, which is something that has, and I'm not there yet, but has its own challenges and Mm -hmm. has its own set of reasons for someone you should all we should all admire so uh you've got that at your arsenal as well a a two-year-old and and a future a ucla basketball star (laughs) maybe (laughs) (laughs) mustafa abdul amid thank you mustafa for coming on and i would love to do this again i i I don't know how you have the time i mean you have a two-year-old you've got a wife you've got a so many different projects you're working on. Let's just say I'm grateful to the T for having you as, as long as I was able to have you on a night like this when you have a whole lot going on. Really appreciate you. I appreciate it, man. I hope I didn't go too far off. I, I didn't start talking about any astrophysics or theoretical math, so you got, you got lucky. I didn't, I didn't really start tripping out, man, uh, but I love these conversations, so I appreciate it, uh, the, the time to chat with you. We are going to use that, what you just said, as a tease for the next episode uh, of the Mustafa podcast where we will (laughs) talk about that stuff because I'm sure we can find a way to relate it to basketball. Oh, absolutely, man. Careful what you wish for, man. You got to go to bed. It's like it's getting late. (laughs) Well, that and now this gives you some some things to marinate in your mind a little bit to think about for the next time you have time for this. We'll have some, some deep thought with Mustafa and how astrophysics influences basketball. Oh, man, get your popcorn ready. Oh, oh, Uh, yeah, gravity, man. I'm going to leave you with one story before we end. I don't know if this has been told, but everybody always talks about, you know, what was it like playing with Russ and Darren? And this is why those teams were so good. I remember when Russell and I were freshers. So me, Russ, James, Keith, and uh, 
and uh, Nikola Dragovich were in the same class. And me and Russ were cool. Like, I really like Russ, but I was trying to play and Russ was trying to play. And so I would see Russ coming out the gym and he'd see me going into the gym, but we see each other on sand dunes down in what was that, Manhattan Beach. And so we wouldn't work out together, man. We were like, I was like, all right, Russ, I know where you've been at. I know what you're trying to do, right? <laughs> Clearly he, he did his thing, right? Uh, amazing work ethic. But I tell you why those teams are so good. I remember walking into the training room and Darren Collison is a, is a, is a great person. But here's what happened. Russ and I, freshmen, walking into the training room. Darren Collison opens the door and me and Russ, what's up, D? You know, opens the door, Darren walks through, doesn't see anything. And I'm telling you, this was a moment Darren was saying, like, hey, like, I run this and we can be teammates, but you are going to have to come through me if you want to play ball. And I think like, some people may say, like, wow, that wasn't a nice thing. I don't mean that at all. Darren and Russ, in, in fact, they became particularly close. Darren was a great influence for me as, you know, as I earned it. But that to me is something that I don't know how it exists anymore. But man, like the toughness of those guys and the competitiveness is something that should not be forgotten. And that was when I, and I woke up and learned, it's like, hey, if you want it, you better go and get it in anything you have to do in life. And, and, and DC and, and Russ, like, that's why those guys were great. So. so they had like these roles that were established on the team. You knew exactly what Darren was supposed to do because he told you. He told you, ex right? Is that right? Yeah, it, well, yeah. I mean, he tried to make it clear, and I also tried to make it clear. I don't care, D. Like, I'm coming to get you. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like if we had to go to blows, it didn't matter. I mean, we didn't. But that's why he was saying, like, if you want to be like wear these letters, wear this jersey, if you want to be on this team. If you want to try to come at me, you better come and get it. And I think that is a healthy way to do it. That's the right way to do it. Because once we started playing, now, like, Darren was going to have your – he had your back. He was going to support you. We were a teammate. Same thing with Russ. But you had to, like – you had to show you could swim. And I think that's a – I think it can be a good thing. I think there's a, two sides of that that uh, I, hope it, I hope continues on at that, at that program and that kind of toughness. And uh, it looks like uh, Coach Cronin, you know, is establishing that type of type of toughness right there. And uh, I'm excited to see the future of UCLA basketball. I think there's a little bit of similarity. You would know much more than I would, Mustafa, between Ben Hallen and Mick Cronin. Just a little bit, maybe, mm -hmm. just based upon principle of, of toughness and being, you know, a defensive menace out there. I can see a little bit. I can see a little bit festering. Yeah, for sure. Coach Holland was like, the strategy wasn't anything complicated. But again, he took something very complex. He made decisions. He was extremely well prepared. And he said, this is what you're going to do. And in practice, we are going to be very competitive. Everything is a battle. And he executed on the, on the court. You execute that defensive, aggressive uh, sort of philosophy or tactics and, and see if the other team can handle it. And most of the times, you know, coach was always about, you know, pressure and pressure in the right moments. He, he'd trap in the funnel. He, he'd trap on the blocks. And sometimes you take a, you, you know, you take a, a beating. But most times other, other folks, other guys can't handle it, especially at the college level. This thing is so frantic, you know. You, you can really rattle guys and speed them up. Um, so it's toughness and it's smart power, I think, is where you, where you want to go with it. With all the seriousness of, of playing and having the pride of being a UCLA Bruin, talking to James Keefe, it sounds like off the court you guys also had a lot of fun. Were you involved in like these Madden? Like, yeah, they were better than I was. That's when I stopped playing. Him and Russ would stay up all night. And he had this like James told me he had this like band that you, yeah, where no, he could James like draw plays. So, so James takes everything to the next level. <laughs> like we, when we lived in we lived in this place on the street called Bronwood, uh, right by 405. And they're very nice apartments now, but it was raggedy when we were living. There. <laughs> but James, so there was a there's an upstairs, three upstairs bedrooms. There was a downstairs. And downstairs was like a, it was straight basement. Like so, there were three levels, and this basement was a link to the garage, and it was a fight to who did not, who was not going to take. Like nobody wanted to live down there. There's probably like creatures down there. And so James, he says, I'll do it. James 
it was like a contractor. He puts carpet down there. He's got a universal remote that's like has all of his, you know, his ties and his watches. He's got like a television system hooked up down there. He turns the garage. He gets couches. He gets a DJ system. He's got like turntables down there. And it was, it was incredible. That's how James is. So in Madden, it was the same thing. He had his plays like he was Tom Brady at the time. He's flipping through playing Madden like that. And I said, this is just way too serious for me, guys. Like, I got to do my homework. I'm going to call you out with Russ and James. They stayed up playing Madden, and I got it done. I was, I was out doing my homework. or I had to finish it late because I hung out with them. But we had a blast, man. And uh, did James also tell you that he won all the one-on-one games that we played when we came in this freshman? He said that he did for the most part, and then – Especially with Russell, yeah, he did too. Yeah, yeah. see, I, yeah, I figured. All right, so well. let me hear your rebuttal to this. <clears throat> My rebuttal is that Russ and I wanted to preserve our noses and our like teeth and our ears because James was six nine, out of control, throwing elbows right, left. You playing it? Like, who wants to? We, we'd be midnight, and you got you know. Where are you playing at midnight? Working. Are you going, are you, are you still in <clears throat> gym, or gym or whatever it's uh, yeah. now, sack or whatever? Um, yeah, we get up there, you know, there was always a, there was always a way in. You could always find a way in. And we go and play and you'd, you'd have a bloody nose. But like, what, like, I'm not trying to have a bloody nose and there's, you know, practice or something tomorrow. So James, uh, James won most of those games. Uh, so I ended up buying a lot of Diddy Reese. Um, James Keefe's. That's right. He yeah. said you bought all the Diddy Reese. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I did. I bought most of it. Okay, yeah. so R- Russ was Russ was a little wild then, but Russ is man. Russ is wonderful pull up. His ability to stop and start was that's why you knew he was going to be a pro. I, mean, I could tell you right then he was going to be a pro. Nobody knew he'd be this good, but like, oh yeah, dude was dude was tough. And James, and James was better than than I think people realize as well too. And the, the injuries between, I think it's junior and senior year, I saw him going into senior, it was either going into junior or going into senior year, playing in the men's gym. Like the athleticism, he was, he was just, he was flowing. And once that, that shoulder got done, he took away a half of the kid's body. And it really, and it really hurt him. But yeah, those, those early years, man, he was, he was a problem, man. A young James before he, uh, he also, they also made him put on like 40 pounds and the kid couldn't move. He had, a, he had like a beard this big and put on 40 pounds and he slowed down. Once he trimmed back up and he was playing before he got hurt, yeah, he was a problem. I went back, Mustafa, and watched that Western Kentucky game. And I was like, that is, I think, I mean, I think he had like 18 points, 12 rebounds. And that is the kind of game that I think he knows, like, if it weren't for the injuries and being in and out of the lineup, that he could have done a lot more of the double-double machine. Oh, for sure. Stuff. For sure. For sure, man. All those guys, man. We, If you look up and down that roster, I know a lot of people, I mean, you see it, Russ is the uh, MVP in the league, right? Darren's been playing or had played for, forever. Aaron, terrific career. Josh Ship was a beast. Like, if Josh didn't have those hip injuries, he, I didn't know how athletic. And he was so athletic and just a scoring machine. And I don't think people realize, like, and even in Europe, if, you, if you're able to find some of the stuff, he was a born, uh, I forget, his first year in Turkey, and then he played at uh, Galatasaray and some others. Yeah. Like, that's after having, like, two surgeries. That guy was so good. And up and down those rosters, everybody played at a high level in Europe, and they played in the league. Um, and the difference in that is very small outside of, you know, like Russell, <laughs> you know, and, and some of that. Um, those guys are right on the cusp. Uh, I mean, Lorenzo, uh, you know, Luke, all those, all those guys, man, were, were really, really good players. I had Lorenzo on last week, and that was mm-hmm. so much fun. And we kept talking about, it. I think this might have been before you were there, but the Gonzaga game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I watched that. I remember watching it. And then I was back in St. Louis. Yeah. And you were like, what were you thinking when you were watching that? That was when I had, hey, I, I want to make sure I get the timeline right, because Coach always called it the, the correct times. But Co- Coach called me after that game. He probably called the guys that were on the recruiting list or whenever 
you know, they were allowed to talk. Sure. And, uh, and he was like, basically, he's like, did you see that? He's <laughs> like, do you want to be a part of that? Yes. And I, are you kidding? <laughs> so I'm sure he called everybody on that, rec- on that recruiting list. There's nothing that recruits better than guys want to go, they want to win and they want to go to the league. Right. And you now got guys who are going to the league and they're winning. Man, that was awesome. I wanted to, be, I wanted, to, I wish I was there. All right. That was incredible. Luke and Bob Mute, man. Clutch, man. Just clutch. He's so clutch. Yeah. So underrated. And how many guys on that roster you were on all went to the league? I mean, you yeah. were naming them mm-hmm. and the list goes on. Easy. Drew Holiday, most, still the most underrated. As much attention and respect as he has. Uh, just an incredibly skilled player and was the most skilled player I'd ever played against at that age, the poise and body control. And um, yeah, all those guys and even better people, man, like Luke and Alfred. Uh, I love Alfred. I remember, oh. yeah, yeah. I had I him mean, on. Just, he was just, so cool. Yeah. I was a good dude. And just, just, just even, even better people. I, I had a tough time transitioning being away from home going through this you don't play a lot sometimes you're trying to get adjusted and it's like you're kind of in the it's a big boys right and I remember one time like <clears throat> just hanging out with Luke and Alfred all day if I eat lunch like yo I got let's take care of his stuff I got you and <clears throat> those little things mean a lot I would do absolutely anything if any of those guys called me uh for anything uh it really is even even the ones that that people don't remember as much or uh, I think, you know, didn't have as successful careers at UCLA or happy careers. There's still some about it. Like any of those guys could call me and I'd do whatever I could to help them. And that's going more than 10 years since. Oh, yeah. And that's no the bond. It's that, that Bruin brotherhood yeah, that is sure. eternal. It's, it's immortal. And Gosh, I want to do this again, Mustafa. Yeah, this was for sure, so cool. Man. I'd love to talk about, especially I think what I'd love to do with you next time is like get more into those those final four years and mm-hmm. just the day to day, the rigors of practice and traveling with the guys and experiences on the bus and all that kind of cool stuff. I'd mm-hmm. love to love to have you on and, and talk more about that. Well, that sounds good, Brian. I appreciate it. It was a, it was a good time to, to reminisce and hang out with you a little bit. And uh, you have a great evening, man. And I, I look forward to, I have to go back and listen to all these. I didn't know you had all these guys on. I'm gonna go back and listen to these podcasts.